it is my privilege to um, introduce a few of the people that we have here tonight. Um, I have uh, Linda Bregan, who is a senior strategic advisor for the Nashville Food Waste Initiative. She's also senior attorney with Environmental Law Institute and a lecturer in law at Vanderbilt Law School. Akili Hu is also with the Environmental Law Institute. She's a research associate there where she works on the Nashville Food Waste Initiative among other projects. In addition to these two women, we have Jen Harmon, who is the Food Waste Reduction Program Manager for Metro, Par uh, excuse me, Metro Nashville Public Works. And she leads programs to help Nashville achieve the goal of zero waste. And finally, we have Sharon Smith, Assistant Director for Metro Nashville Public Works, who um, her projects include solid waste planning and others. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with my friend, Linda Bregan, who also is co-chair of the Nature Center Committee here at Warner Park Nature Center. Linda, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Heather, for your initiative and your enthusiasm. I'm smiling all the way through that introduction because your enthusiasm is just really uh, infectious. And I also want to thank Vera Roberts, who runs the Nature Center, and Rachel Anderson for staying late and helping out tonight. You all are just doing incredible work. And you know the parks are just about my favorite place in the city. So we are delighted to be here virtually tonight to talk about food waste in Nashville and tell you about some of our work with the Nashville Food Waste Initiative and then share some strategies for how you can address food waste. So if we go to the next slide and even the next slide, um, our goal as laid out on the slide um, is, is basically to engage the entire Nashville community, the public and private sectors in addressing food waste, whether it is preventing food waste or rescuing surplus food or recycling food scraps. And if you go to the next slide, here is our team. Um, we started uh, Nashville Food Waste Initiative as a pilot project back in 2015. Uh, it was a project of the Natural Resources Defense Council, an, an international NGO. Um, I served as project director of the pilot until 2020 when the initiative happily transitioned to a permanent project of the Urban Green Lab, which is just what you hope for when you do a pilot project, that it will have staying power. Uh, so Todd um, and De Deanna now lead the National Food Waste Initiative, and, and Nikili and I are with the Environmental Law Institute, as Heather mentioned, uh, also an international nonprofit uh, NGO where we serve as advisors along with um, Darby Hoover from NRDC. So next slide. Uh, some of you may have heard this uh, statistic before, but we waste up to 40% of our food in this country, as we will discuss, 40%. And this is a problem for so many reasons. It's a waste of natural resources. It costs a lot. It contributes to climate change. And it's just troubling from a social justice perspective when so many people are food insecure. So in our effort to address this problem, we take a multifaceted approach that includes policy development, education and outreach, research and capacity building. We try to do it all. And uh, we'll describe examples of each of these throughout our presentation. But all of our work is governed by the food waste reduction hierarchy. And uh, this is the EPA food recovery hierarchy. There are other versions of this, some with even more detail than this. Um, the big takeaway is we want first to prevent food waste from happening. And if we can't do that, we want to feed hungry people or what we call rescue surplus food. If we can't do that, we want to feed animals. So for example, Walmart sends a lot of its uh, food scraps to hog farms. If not that, industrial use. If not that, composting or recycling of food scraps, which you'll learn uh, a lot more about from Jen and Sharon tonight. And the very last place we want our food waste to go is the landfill. But as of now, on a national level, about 95% of all food waste ends up in landfills. So that's the last place we want it. We obviously have a lot of work to do. Uh, at the national level, the Department of Agriculture and the Environmental Protection Agency have set a food waste reduction goal of 50% by 2030. That's less than 10 years, right? It's an ambitious goal but it's something they think is achievable. And as we know, the federal government isn't always, you know, they're not always risk takers in setting these kind of goals. So I think it really signals that 
there's real possibility here. I often remark that food waste is about the only Obama era environmental initiative that the Trump administration embraced. And I fully assume that Biden um, administration will as well. And in addition, Nashville has adopted a zero waste goal by 2050, not just food waste, always. And Jen and Sharon will talk more about that. So I'm going to hand it over now to Akili to do the numbers on food waste in Nashville and around the country. Thanks, Linda. So we will now provide an overview of the state of food waste in the United States Nashville. As Linda mentioned, up to 40% of food is wasted in America. So to give an analogy, that would be like going to the grocery store, buying five bags of groceries and leaving two in the parking lot. So while we waste this much food, at the same time, recent data from Feeding America shows that one in nine people in the U.S. are food insecure. And in Tennessee, one in seven people are food insecure, meaning they don't always have enough food to eat. We don't yet have a firm figure on what the increase is um, from the pandemic, but some reports show that one in four households are reporting food insecurity. So to give you a sense of the magnitude of this amount of waste, less than one third of the food we throw out would be enough to feed all of the food insecure Americans. Um, but of course, there are huge logistical challenges in accomplishing this. So wasted food also wastes all the resources that went into producing it. This data from NRDC shows that wasted food in America accounts for roughly 20% of all U.S. cropland, 20% of agricultural water use, and roughly 20% of fertilizers are used for food that we don't eat. That excess fertilizer can also run off into streams. The climate change impact of all this food waste is equivalent to 37 million passenger vehicles. Wasted food also accounts for roughly 20% of landfill content by weight. So we know that when organics decompose in a landfill without oxygen, it generates much more methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, much more powerful than carbon dioxide. So that means diverting food waste from the landfill can help us feed our neighbors and also slow climate change. A report from NRDC in 2017 estimates that each Nashvillian wastes about 3.5 pounds of food per week. In the United States as a whole, growing, processing, transporting, and disposing all of this food has an annual estimated cost of $218 billion, which equals about $1,800 per household annually. So you can see here that in Nashville, the largest waste by category besides inedible waste is edible fruits and vegetables and leftovers. So we're gonna talk in a minute about how you can avoid this waste. So I believe we have another poll for you all. And um, here we're gonna have you guess what is the top food wasted in Nashville? So what type of food? So we're gonna give you a second to answer that. And Heather, if you wouldn't mind letting us know when we're ready to reveal answers once people have had time to think about it a bit and choose between the options. Oh, okay, great. Interesting results. So eight, about you know 79% fruits and vegetables. I'm going to close that. And, oops. So revealing the answer, um, the top food wasted by type in Nashville is coffee, including liquid coffee and grounds, followed by bananas and chicken. So was coffee on the list? <laughs> I think I'm realizing that maybe it was. <laughs> uh, well, for learning- so if, you, if you guess that, you are really a star. <laughs> Maybe some people have that in the back of their minds, which is great. <laughs> and please feel free to let us know. Um, so moving forward, as Linda mentioned, food waste prevention is the top most preferred strategy for reducing food waste. And earlier we showed the EPA's food recovery hierarchy. So this is a more simplified version made by the organization Refed. And we use this to focus on the three main strategies of prevention, rescue, and recycling. So Linda is now going to speak about some of our projects related to these strategies. At least once in every Zoom call, I forget to unmute. So, um, 
great. In the prevention category, um, one of the things we've been doing is helping to develop policies in Nashville that will reduce food waste. Todd Lawrence and I have served on um, several committees convened by our mayors over the last five years. Um, and these initiatives have really provided an opportunity to help shape the city's agenda on sustainability efforts, including food waste. Most recently, I've been co-chairing the mayor's sustainability advisory committee, which just yesterday actually presented its recommendations to the mayor on Nashville's climate action plan, including recommendations on food waste reduction actions. And, you know, I just want to emphasize that a really important way you can help reduce food waste in our city is through civic engagement. With all the policy initiatives we um, have participated in, there are opportunities for public comment and input. I know from working with Jen and Sharon, two of the most dedicated public servants I've ever known, um, that you will hear from soon tonight, that they take your input really seriously. If they do a poll or they ask for input at a public meeting on um, like the zero waste goal, for example, they really take that into account. Um, and I just really encourage you not to hesitate to weigh in with the mayor's office, with metro departments, with your council members about what's important to you on sustainability, including food waste. It helps them establish their priorities for funding and legislation and other initiatives. Um, in the near future, there'll be an opportunity for public input on the city's climate action plan, for example. Um, if you go to the next slide, a key project we've worked on over the years is the Mayor's Food Saver Challenge. This began in 2017 as a 30-day challenge to restaurants to adopt five food saving practices of their choice from a whole menu of options. And then in November 2018, the challenge was relaunched on a continuing basis with the entire hospitality sector. Uh, it is now in abeyance, but um, post COVID, we encourage everyone to talk to the restaurants that you patronize and ask them to participate in this challenge. It's another way that you can have an impact. Restaurants and businesses that you patronize regularly, they care about your opinion. So if you tell a restaurant, that you want them to participate in the challenge or simply adopt some measures like only putting bread or chip basket refills on the table after they've asked if you want it or offering compostable takeaway containers or donating surplus food or composting food scraps, they, they will listen. Uh, if you go to the next. Um, as part of our outreach and education efforts, we uh, what we call the Save the Food materials. Um, they are free materials at savethefood.com. Uh, there's a share tab where you can access them. Anyone can download them, videos, posters, uh, everything. Um, right now, I think um, I'm told we have about 10 Save the Food billboards up right now. That's thanks to Sharon and Jen. Uh, be on the lookout for those. Uh, over the years, we've had them in buses and university dining halls and sports arenas. If you have any ideas for placement of these materials, let us know. Uh, and please, you know, download the Save the Food materials from savethefood.com to put in your workplace or your home when we have get back to work. Um, if you go, to, yes, good. The next slide, uh, we also try to do fun community events to raise awareness, such as film showings, like the film Wasted with Anthony Bourdain. Uh, and over a year ago, we did a Waste Not cooking competition uh, with the James Beard Foundation uh, that we had at Vanderbilt to promote the reuse of, of food scraps in kitchens. And so it was like um, a cooking contest on TV, but the ingredients were food scraps. So the chefs got things like potato peels. And I think there's a video of this on our um, National Food Waste Initiative YouTube channel. We're supposed to do it again this summer, but had to postpone. Um, but look for an, a virtual event this year with Nashville celebrity chefs again in the James Beard Foundation. They, the restaurants love partnering with James Beard because they ask so give the culinary awards. Um, on this next slide, uh, we, well, we're like Urban Green Lab, um, host trainings throughout the year for teachers and nonprofits and businesses on sustainable practices, including food waste reduction. And um, the next slide, uh, Urban Green Lab also develops curricula and trains teachers on how to incorporate sustainability, including training on food waste prevention and reduction into their lessons. Um, next slide, we also develop develop educational materials such as this handout on food waste prevention for families, which was included with meal services provided by the Metro Nashville Public Schools during the pandemic. Um, this flyer includes some tips for households uh, to prevent and recycle food waste, and we'll go over some of those in a minute. Um, this next slide, I just want to mention that as part of our work, my group, uh, the Environmental Law Institute, has also conducted research um, as 
really trying to identify what are the barriers and what are the different um, opportunities? Uh, how do we overcome those barriers? And we've um, looked at food rescue, we've looked at food scrap recycling, we've looked at community composting, which is something that we're embarking on now. If you have any interest in learning about that, we are looking for places to do pilot community composting uh, sites or education sites. And Warner Parks is gonna be an education site on community composting, which we're really excited about. Um, so if you are, if you wanna nerd out and do a deeper dive on any of this. These are all posted on the Urban Green Lab website. They have a National Food Waste Initiative um, page. Um, okay, next, um, what I, I want to just mention is food rescue or donating um, surplus food to those who need it. And, and then Achilles is going to talk about how you can get involved. When we started this initiative, NRDC conducted a study of how much food was out there um, that could be rescued. And these numbers are somewhat um, dated at this point. Um, and I, I know we're running short of time. So I just want to um, say that the takeaway here is that there is a lot of food out there that needs um, and could be rescued. And uh, we have a, at last count had a 19 million meal gap a year. That's how many more meals we needed to make sure that food insecure members of our community had the food they needed. So um, we could bridge that meal gap by almost half if we could rescue all that food. Of course, it's not realistic logistically, but it just gives you a sense of the magnitude of the waste as Achilles said earlier. Um, and let me just go um, to these next ones um, as we are running short on time. Um, a key barrier we identified uh, to donation is that people are afraid they could be liable if they donate food and somebody gets sick. And let me just say this is not a legitimate concern. Federal law provides liability protections for food donors. Um, it's a gross negligence standard, which in the law is an incredibly high standard. I mean, you essentially have to almost intentionally donate bad food in order to be held liable. And in fact, Harvard's done research on this and has found not a single lawsuit over food donation. And that's incredible because people sue about everything. Uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I'm just saying this is not a serious concern. And the state of Tennessee, so the federal law sets a floor, but states can go even more protective. And uh, the state legislature recently did that. And now not only organizations donating food, but individuals will have protection under state law. And this has not even been um, codified. It's not even in the books yet, but we will be um, getting information out about that. And the very last thing I want to mention before I hand it back to Akili to talk about what you can do um, is um, we have been um, collaborating with the health department because a lot of restaurants are worried about donating food because they think the health department might not like it. So we did this wonderful brochure that explains that it really is okay. You just follow the same food safety procedures you would always follow. You get liability protection. You even get an enhanced tax incentive. And that was just really important coming from them, not us, um, from their regulators. And then the last thing I want to um, say is that one of the other projects we've done is match large generators of food scraps with nonprofits that can take that food. Sometimes um, organizations, businesses just need help with the logistics, right? This food is often left over late at night. They often don't have a way to transport it. So we've done some matchmaking. And to give you a sense, um, the first year the Country Music Hall of Fame had a partner to take this food, they um, rescued 14,000 pounds of food. That was 14,000 pounds of food that was thrown away the year before. So it really, really can make a difference. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Achille to talk about what households can do. Great, thanks. Um, so what can households do to prevent food waste and rescue surplus food? Linda has talked about civic, enga civic engagement and patronizing businesses, and Sharon and Jen will talk about compost in a little bit. Um, so for now, I will talk about volunteering and preventing food waste at home. One way to prevent food waste is to understand date labels. So for example, best before, use by, and sell by are used to predict peak quality, not food safety. The exception to this is baby food and formula, which are regulated and should be followed, um, the dates on those. And instead, your eyes, nose, and common sense are some of the best ways to tell if your food is safe to eat. Most food can also be frozen to eat later. Fro freezing food is like pushing the pause button on freshness. 
Another great resource is, as Linda mentioned, savethefood.com. They have things like the guesstimator, which helps you plan for large parties to avoid making too much food. Uh, meal Prep Mate, which helps you create meal plans and shopping lists. They have a lot of tips on preparation and storing food, recipes for using food scraps, and other ways to save food at home. There are lots of books on the topic of food waste prevention, but one that's particularly user-friendly for anyone wanting a deeper dive is the Waste-Free Kitchen Handbook, A Guide to Eating Well and Saving Money by Wasting Less Food. And the author, Dana Gunders, founded NRDC's initiative to reduce food waste and also wrote a landmark report about how America is losing up to 40% of its food. And also for food rescue, another good way to get involved is to volunteer with a group that rescues food. Of course, keeping in mind COVID safety protocols during this time. And as you can see, we just wanted to give a few examples of the many, many organizations working on food rescue in Nashville. Um, some of these groups are also involved at the Nashville Food Waste Initiative Steering Committee. Second Harvest Food Bank in particular can always use a lot of volunteers. I know Linda and her family have volunteered and they, they can accommodate families, businesses and other groups for volunteering. And organizations currently accepting volunteers include Second Harvest along with One Generation Away, Nashville Rescue Mission. Um, you can find all of this information about volunteering opportunities on any of their websites. So thank you so much for having um, our portion for today. Please continue to follow our work at the website below and contact us if you have any questions. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Jen and Sharon for Public Works. All right, thank you so much, Akili and Linda. That was fabulous. Y'all did a really wonderful job really prepping why we have all of um, everything that we have in our zero waste master plan to address uh, food waste. So let me pull up my screen here. So we're going to talk a little bit about Nashville Zero Waste Master Plan, um, just really high level briefly and specifically on the food waste section of that plan, um, and then talk about some programs that we offer uh, to help you reduce your, weight, your food waste at home. Um, so let me move some things around here. All right, so um, Nashville Solid Waste Master Plan Achieving Zero Waste. So here in Tennessee, all counties are required by law to have a 10-year plan on how to manage and reduce our waste that's going to uh, what are called municipal solid waste landfills. Um, so those are the landfills, the trash that you're throwing out, your regular garbage, that's all going to a municipal solid waste landfill, um, that everyday garbage. And so Nashville's current plan, it goes in be a, a, above and beyond those goals that the state has set um, to help Nashville get to what's called zero waste. So instead of sending most of our waste to landfills while doing some recycling, doing some programs to reduce that waste, we wanna go above that and work towards keeping 90% of the waste that we generate out of our landfills. So it's a really big lofty goal. And right now, um, as you can see on the chart here, this was done, um, the study that was done as part of the Zero Waste Master Plan with these numbers are from 2016, but our, our rate was about 18% um, of reducing that waste. So keeping that waste out of landfills. So about 80% of our waste, that means, is going to landfills. Um, the majority of that goes to a landfill out in Murfreesboro, um, and that's anticipated to close within the next decade. Um, I've heard a lot of numbers, six or seven years, but we're looking at less than 10 years when that landfill is going to close. So when that happens, we I don't think anybody wants to build a new landfill here in Davidson County. The Zero Waste Master Plan certainly does not recommend that and nobody wants a landfill in their backyard. So we have to look at, okay, if we don't have that landfill to send this waste to, then what do we do? Do we truck it farther away to another landfill? So that's gonna cost the city more money. It uses more energy and then creates more emissions for that transportation to move that waste. Um, and all to bury garbage where it's not going to decompose because it doesn't really decompose in a landfill setting. It just sits there doing nothing. It serves no value to our community while also impacting another community because that landfill is going to be in someone else's backyard. Um, as well as um, both Linda and Akili mentioned, it creates those greenhouse gases, that methane that isn't um, going to be harmful to our environment. So it's just not a sustainable solution for our future for the city and certainly not for future generations. So by working towards zero waste, we can get away from that reliance on the system of landfilling and look at waste management instead as resource management. So instead of looking at 
where's the next place we're going to throw this out? Where's the next place we're going to dispose of all and get rid of all of this material? Instead, we say, um, let's look at the value of our stuff and how we can manage those resources in a way that's going to be good for Nashville, that's going to be good for our community, and it's going to be better for our environment. Um, so it's really starting at the top of that waste hierarchy um, that was shared earlier in the presentation, really looking at how do we first reduce, then reuse, then recycle at the last, and letting recycle be more of that last resort rather than landfilling and really put landfill at the very, very bottom at this, of this list. And so taking landfill from being the standard and being that very, very last resort instead. So this, of course, it's a lofty goal. It's not going to happen overnight. The plan stretches over about 30 years um, and it was just approved in 2019. So we're at the beginning of this journey. Um, and based on a waste characterization study that was completed as part of this plan. So um, not me, but some, uh, some wonderful folks dug through all of our trash to figure out exactly what we're throwing away here in Nashville to help us focus on where we can make the biggest impact. And those um, and three specific areas are improving and increasing recycling programs, both for residents and for businesses. There's still a lot, you know, there's a lot of problems with recycling. There's a lot of things to work out with recycling, but there's also a lot of really good recycling that's still ending up in landfill. So we can do better with our recycling programs. Um, the second area is requiring more recovery and recycling of construction and demolition waste. As you can imagine here in Nashville, there's a lot of construction and demolition going on even with the pandemic. Um, so there's uh, some opportunity there. But then last but not least, one of the other major biggest impact areas that we have is to reduce our food waste through the food donation programs, through composting, um, and a lot of the different things that, um, that Linda and Akili shared. So here in Nashville, about one third of our food waste, or one third of our waste, excuse me, is food and yard waste. So all of those, that organic type waste, it's about a third of what we're throwing away. And at minimum, all of that can be composted. So some waste material like plastics is what I'm often getting most questions about and people get really frustrated with plastics. There's not necessarily a current viable, reasonable solution to keep that material out of landfill right now once that material is created. But food and yard waste, they come from the earth, they can go back to the earth the way nature intended it to. So there's a ready solution for this material. Again, that's gonna benefit the community and our environment. But then also, so we're looking at that, but then also above that, um, I think it was already you know, shared so well that we can look above composting to some of the programs um, to feed members of our community that are in need. So we can really go much higher on that waste hierarchy. Um, and of course, we are extremely thankful to have the National Food Waste Initiative working on so many of those programs. Um, I tell you, it's, it's me and Sharon. And so having a whole group of people to be able to help us work towards achieving these goals is really going to be um, a driving force to move this uh, move this forward to achieve these this part of the zero waste master plan. Um, but of course, all through that, um, we have to have public education. So I'm really excited that we are able to share, and I'm able to be here to share this with you today. Um, so just a little bit quicker, deeper dive into the zero waste master plan. So in addition to knowing those focus areas. The plan does go to further identify specific strategies and best practices that we can implement. Um, and these are strategies that address every aspect of how waste and materials are managed and all of these different strategies and best practices, they really have to work in concert with each other to be able to move everything forward. So all of these different things, we have to look at policy. So what can be required by law, as well as what, um, what Metro can do for its own internal policies for managing waste. And one of the biggest um, policy recommendations is to look at how we can ban food waste uh, from being thrown in the trash. So we already have cardboard and electronics that's banned from your trash bin. How can we add food waste to that? As well as how can we require more rescue of that surplus food for donation? Um, and then we have to also make sure, so if you ban all of that food, we also have to make sure that we can manage that. So we have to have the infrastructure to support those policies. Um, right now we have one commercial or one industrial composting facility that accepts food waste. Um, and really it's the only one in the state. Uh, and that facility is not large enough. It does not have the capacity to manage all of the food waste if we start banning it from our trash cans. Um, so we have to figure out how can we help expand that capacity to process that food waste. Um, and then after that, we still have to continue that infrastructure journey of looking at, okay, if we have the capacity, 
how do we get it there? Do we have the bins, the, the carts to collect it in? Do we have the trucks and do we have the staff? So there's a lot of pieces that have to work together. And that's just to, to ban food waste from the cart and get it into a, a compost situation. For food donation, again, you have to go through all of those steps and make sure the infrastructure is in place so that if we are requiring more food donation, there is a the, the collection programs and the transportation and all of that logistical um, pieces that are in place to make that happen. And then looking at our end markets. So you have the facilities, you have the equipment. You also have to make sure that the meals that are created, the compost that's created, or that food for livestock that's created has to have somebody that's going to be able to use it. Otherwise, you've just spent a lot of time and money to process something into a nicer product that ends up in the trash. So for compost, you need buyers of that finished product. Um, for you know meals, you need somebody that you know you need a way to get that food to those people in need. So um, one of the ways the the plan looks at this is how Metro can increase um, or can incorporate compost requirements into the procurement process, as well as how we might change building codes to require the use of local compost um, for a soil amendment. So those are all included. Um, and then the plan also looks at waste collection, at access to waste collection services and how that can be improved. Um, so currently we offer curbside service for trash and recycling to about 140,000 single family households in Nashville. And that's really just in the urban core. Then we have four convenience centers and 10 recycling drop off sites to service folks that are outside of um, those, cur those uh, curbside services. And those four convenience centers are the only places for compost drop off. There's no curbside um, compost collection at this time. So how do we expand all of that service to all of the households across the county? How do we address commercial businesses, public schools and spaces, as well as multifamily re uh, residents? We really need to make sure and this plan addresses how do we get access to all of these programs to everybody in the county, both residents and businesses. And then of course, you can't do that without funding. So that's included as well. Waste and recycling services are currently funded um, through the, and, and those composting, um, the composting drop-off. All that stuff that we do is funded through the city's general fund. So that comes from tax dollars. So that's why curbside services are only offered to certain folks because they pay a higher tax rate to be able to, to have access to those services. So the plan also includes recommendations on how can we create a more sustainable funding structure to support all of these programs as well. Um, so that is the, uh, you know, over 200 pages distilled into three slides. Um, it's a lot of work. There's a lot to be done and a whole third of it really is, um, is on food waste. So um, now, okay, so that's the plan. That's what we're working on. What can you do at home and what resources do we offer to help you reduce your food waste at home as we work to establish these, um, these larger and, and more broad programs? Well, the first thing that you can do is start composting at home. Um, it's really easy. I think people are really afraid of compost because they think, oh, it's rotting food in my backyard. It's gonna attract pests. It's gonna smell bad. None of that's true. Uh, it's as long as you do it right and it's not that difficult to, to do it right. Um, you can get started at home. Um, I like to say everything rots. It's just a matter of learning how to manage that, that rotting process at home. Um, and so we do offer, the number one program that we offer is our Dirt on Composting Workshop. It is offered once a month. We're doing it virtually. Um, I hope to be able to have in-person um, programs again to really get dirty in composting and learn um, hands-on. But right now we have a great workshop that you can attend. It's once a month. Um, and after that program, you'll be able to have the confidence to really get started composting at home, um, as well as each program has two chances to win an earth machine compost bin. So um, there are free compost bins to be given away during each presentation. But then if you can't attend, we do also share it. So that website on there, publicworkswebinars.nashville.gov, that's where you can sign up. Um, we need, we'll get some new, um, some some new registrations up uh, soon. They are not there yet, but I will get them up soon um, for February and beyond. Um, but then you can also watch this on demand as well if you don't have time to participate in the, in the live webinar. Um, and then as well as online, at, um, you'll find other resources to get started composting at home as well if you don't wanna watch the video participate in one of those webinars. 
Um, now, if you don't win a free compost bin, you can still get started. There are a lot of um, options for compost bins out there, um, but we do offer a, a discounted rate for the Earth Machine compost bin at our Omaha Hundred Convenience Center. So if you want a really great option for a starter compost bin um, at a really good price, uh, we provide that at, um, at our Omaha Hundred Convenience Center. So you can pick those up there. Um, for 50 bucks, which is great. And they're a really great bin because at the top you open it up and you can just easily toss everything in. But then as your compost finished, there's a little hatch at the bottom and you can pull it out, which is, um, it's just a really nice option, especially if you've never composted before. And it's made from recycled plastic. Um, if you want to get really fancy, you can start composting with worms, especially if you have family and you're looking for something to do with your kids. I think this is a great one we have online. We do have a guide on how to get started composting with worms. It's very different from backyard composting. So just make sure that you, uh, if you do want to get started with that, it's, it's a special kind of worms and um, not difficult to put together, but you'll want to check and see how to do it properly. But it's a fun option and you can do it inside as well. So if you have a small space and you want to compost some food scraps, this is also a great option. And then if you are just not ready to compost at home or maybe you don't have the space at all, you don't want to compost with worms and, and get that involved, we do have our compost drop off um, available for free to all residents in Davidson County. So these are available at all four of our convenience centers across the county. Um, it's free, you can bring any kind of food scrap that you have. And the nice thing about this is, um, and if you take the Dirt on Composting Workshop, you'll learn that not everything can be composted at home. Some things just need a different process. Um, and so things like meats, fats, dairy products, you don't wanna include that in your backyard compost bin. Um, but you can take them here to our compost drop-off site. Same thing with compostable plastics or um, especially like cooked leftover food during the holidays or bulky organic type material. So like you have a bunch of, you have carved so many pumpkins for Halloween and you just don't have the capacity for them in your backyard compost bin, you can bring those to a drop-off site as well so that you're not putting them in your trash can. Um, and this all goes to the compost company to be, so they have an industrial composting facility and can manage all of that material. And then I know this was mentioned, um, the community composting program. Um, so we are very excited to be working with the National Food Waste Initiative on, try on supporting community composting. Um, this is just provides additional access and options for folks uh, to, to be able to drop off food scraps, but it's a community-led program. So what's great about community composting is that there's that educational piece that's part of it. So, um, if we've got one that has started Hillsborough West End neighbors at Trinity Presbyterian Church have started one and Public Works will uh, support that by providing bins, signage and help with educational resources as well to get started. Um, but the more community composting sites there are, the more opportunity there is to learn about composting, get people excited and just provides more access for folks to be able to drop off food scraps as well. So it's very similar to backyard composting, um, but there's a lot of different options and it can be a, a slightly larger um, uh, operation than just a backyard compost bin um, for neighbors to get together and do that. So we're really excited to support those. Um, and then of course, um, starting at a young age is really important, uh, making sure that kids and um, students learn these habits at a young age. So we do have some educational materials uh, for students at all different age levels. Um, these are of course my favorite coloring pages because even adults love to color these days. So if you wanna uh, pull these up, we've got them in English and Spanish, um, but we've also got some other educational resources on our website as well for teachers and for students. Um, and then uh, we've also shared that with Metro Nashville Public Schools that as part of their STEAM resources as well that are available in public schools. Um, when the pandemic comes to an end and we are able to get back really in earnest in schools, um, we also do provide bins for teachers for um, compost education and science programming in schools as well. Um, so for those of you, if you have kids and look further down the line, feel free to reach back out to us later at that time. Um, and then of course we can always share a dirt on composting webinar uh, with any of the appropriate aged groups for that as well. But that is, uh, those are kind of the ways that we have. Um, happy to answer any questions about that. These are our contacts. Um, I've got a few um, websites at the top where you can get um, the most information about composting specifically and sign up for any of our workshops coming up.
Heather, you're on mute. I was waiting for you to stop sharing your screen. That Sorry, was wonderful. That was wonderful, Jen. We've already had some questions coming in. Is everybody good to hang around a little bit longer for some questions? Okay, Heidi um, posed this question um, to both the Nashville, um, the Nashville Food Waste Initiative, but also um, Jen, you and Sharon can address this as well. She says, has the Nashville Food Waste Initiative considered using schools as a main infrastructure for number one, education, and number two, compost centers? Hang on, she's got more. Every neighborhood has a school, and if individuals don't compost for whatever reason, then maybe the school compost sites can be used by that community. Of course, who would manage these sites? A science teacher. Um, and then, um, she said um, she'd love you guys to directly answer if the school sites are being considered as compost sites, if that's possible. Back to you guys. Do, should I take that first? Sure, go for it. Um, so as I mentioned, we are um, just starting an initiative on community composting and Sharon and Jen have been working with one particular project for a while now. Uh, we did a series of webinars on community composting. And again, you know, just for reference, as Jen said, it's it's bigger than backyard composting, but it's not commercial scale composting, right? It's it's a, a community getting together um, to compost. And so we did a series of webinars and um, those links are posted on our website so you can um, uh, listen to them. And they were run by a woman named Brenda Platt from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance who is literally the national expert on composting. And now, um, and they are developing training modules that will also be available. So if a year from now, somebody's interested in starting um, to do a community compost project, they will have these modules to, to look at and we can provide signage. So we were looking for some pilot projects and also what we're calling education projects where people would just come and learn about community composting. So we do have two um, learn like um, demonstration sites. One's going to be at the Warner Parks Nature Center. One is going to be at the Land Trust for Tennessee's Glen Levin Farms. And then we're working on several pilots. And coincidentally, one of them is at a school for exactly the reasons you're talking about. And, and just backing up for a second, um, education and schools are at the core of, of National Food Waste Initiative's work. That is what Urban Green Lab does. They are fantastic at it. It's why we were so delighted when they wanted to take over the National Food Waste Initiative. They're developing curricula, they train teachers. So absolutely, um, schools in some ways are the main infrastructure on education. And I just didn't talk about it as much because it's really um, Urban Green Lab are really the, the professionals. But I just came from touring an elementary school that wants to have a compost site. And so we are gonna, we're gonna try it and um, see if it works for community composting. And you put your finger on it, um, the question is who's going to run it and more importantly it's sort of who's going to volunteer because the problem with schools is you've got the long summer break and you got the vacations and so you've got to find a way to have community volunteers as well and of course like the you know you get parents but then their kids leave the school and it's not going to stay so there's some logistical challenges but um but yes we are considering all of um the points that you made jen did you want to I'd like to um, I'd like to add a little bit to that because I completely agree and Linda I really appreciate your comments. The concept of of having um, community compost or compost sites with school is obviously uh, super important uh, with schools being um, crucial to our community education. But if you think about those of you who might be familiar with the Bell Garden out at the Bellevue, I believe it's the Bellevue Middle School that is heavily managed with volunteers, people going out there every day. And it, a, a school-based uh, community composting program will only be successful if it has a strong volunteer support from the community. Because, you know, bless them, those uh, teachers are already super busy and the ones that are taking extra time to help us with food waste diversion are absolute saints, but each one of us would need to chip in and do our part to make it successful. Having composting, active composting at every school 
uh, would, in my opinion, absolutely be a dream come true, but it's going to take a village. Absolutely will take a village. Well, believe it or not, guys, we've got some more questions. Oh. And, and okay, I believe I was gonna... that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, and to Sharon's point, what we're trying to do with these pilots are create templates, basically, like try to get the kinks out, try to come up with the approach for getting volunteers and scheduling volunteers so that we can share that and everyone's not sort of starting from scratch. So our next question comes from Ms. Nielsen. She says, uh, saw a presentation on getting an industrial digester, question mark. For Nashville, what the likelihood of making that happen? I think before we answer this, let's talk about what an industrial digester is, guys. So a digester is exactly what it sounds like. And I actually have a small backyard digester in my garden. Um, and what digesters do is they take and basically process dewater and kind of compost the, the food waste, or in the case of my digester, which is called a green cone, can take uh, fats, oils, and grease. It can take um, uh, an entire rotisserie chicken, I've been told. I don't eat rotisserie chicken, so I have never tried it, uh, but the manufacturer swears by it. So a large scale system like that um, is absolutely something that um, Nashville is thinking about. What um, Nashville has been looking in as part of the long-term zero waste plan is an anaerobic digester, which basically takes the organic uh, waste and in a controlled environment, breaks it down. Right now, Metro contracts with the compost company, which is a uh, facility located just outside of Davidson County. And they use open um, aerated piles. So they've got food waste and uh, wood chips and everything all piled up together and it works really well, particularly in a more rural setting where uh, because there could potentially be odors. Having a controlled environment is perfect for a more metropolitan area for a city and um, it is something that we are looking at. It is something that is part of the long term zero waste plan. It is um, part of the um, uh, the recommendations, but that's a that's a type of program that takes um, uh, funding. And it also works best when we have um, large amounts of food waste that are being required to be diverted so that there is um, a, a, a constant regular amount of material or feedstock going into the facility. But super excited that people in Nashville are thinking about that because that is an excellent way for us to manage our food waste in the future. I've got another comment coming in from Heidi and she shares that she volunteered through Hands on Nashville for a Metro High School garden program all summer long. And it was wonderful. Many of us regulars, uh, excuse me, many of us were regulars and she'd suggest Pilot Elementary School connect with Hands on Nashville and see what happens. Thanks Heidi, sounds like a good suggestion. It, it is a great suggestion. And we literally at our team meeting a couple of weeks ago were saying, we don't think that we're working with hands on Nashville enough. So, um, and, and the other thing that we've thought of is partnering with businesses that are looking for, um, you know, projects that their employees can do, you know, service projects. So, um, but it's, it is funny you mentioned hands on Nashville. So we, we agree. I want to go ahead and open up the floor um, for all of our attendees. If you have something to share, like Heidi's volunteer experience, or if you have questions, we've got a really great group of, um, of people well-versed in food waste, public works, and um, throwing things away, how not to do that. Uh, we've got a hand raised by Diane S. Diane, what do you have to share? List it in the chat for us. Again, guys, we can't see you um, if you can if you can see us. So if you want to share something, you need to share it in the chat or in the Q and A, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, this entire presentation, if if you don't remember. Is being, um, 
is being um, recorded and uh, will be made into a YouTube video, which you can, can check out on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and put in Warner Park Nature Center. And you can check out all of our other videos, which by the way, Sharon and Jen, your, your presentation made me think of our presentation back in um, December by Turnip Green Creative Reuse. Okay, we've got a question just came in. How do our local grocery stores work to reduce food waste? Who wants to take that one? You want it, Linda? I, I can well, start. Yeah, you, you start. start and then I'll go. Okay, well, I was gonna say, say that, um, and, and uh, Linda, you probably were gonna bring this up, is Kroger has been a, an amazing supporter of food waste. And a lot of people may be surprised to know that uh, Kroger nationwide has a zero hunger, zero waste uh, program that they're rolling out. They've supported the National Food Waste Initiative, but every Kroger store has a, a food waste collection container. It's not for public use, it's for the store. And I get so excited every time I see them because uh, our local grocery stores also uh, see this as important and are wanting to do their part. And I, I, that's it, that is everything you said is absolutely true. And I would also say that our research shows there is a lot more food that could be donated from grocery stores. And I think particularly uh, prepared food as that's become increasingly popular. We did launch a, oh gosh, I'm sorry, it's so loud. Uh, we did launch a food retailers challenge. Um, goodness, sorry, right at, Right after the success of the restaurant challenge pilot, we launched a food retailers challenge. And as Sharon says, Kroger stepped right up. They had already launched this zero hunger, zero waste campaign and they've been incredible partners. But um, we would welcome anyone's help in getting other food retailers to join the mayor's challenge on that. And, um, and I think um, it's a little more complicated with grocers because there's something called the Feeding America Network, which is doing this amazing job of partnering food banks with grocery stores. Um, but that's a very you know formal process. And that's how the huge amounts of donations that are occurring now are happening. But I still think there's more that could be done. You know, Linda, let's go ahead and stay on that for a minute. Um, we just had a question come in. Where does Kroger donate food in Nashville and in, in, in Middle Tennessee? Are there designated nonprofits that they share their expired food with? Um, so um, most of the food that grocery stores donate goes to Second Harvest Food Bank. And then Second Harvest turns around and distributes among a huge number of food pantries and other agencies um, around Nashville. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the basic um, setup. I wanna, I wanna go back to Jen and Sharon with this next question. I love that we've got so much engagement over this topic. This is, this is terrific. Uh, one of our one of our folks shared when you're setting up a community compost at school at schools I understand that Westmead Elementary School had too much to handle on site and had to go with compost Nashville and we haven't talked about compost Nashville so we might might want to talk about them can the community composting actually handle the volumes of the community so that's a great question because um uh Karen uh, McIntyre at Westmead has done an incredible job. She is such a champion for all things sustainability in schools and has really led a huge charge on that and um, has gotten grant money and community support to um, implement composting at, um, at Westmead Elementary. Um, so essentially the amount of food that's being produced, so they do have some share tables. They also have donation that she has set up as well to donate surplus, good surplus food from Westmead, but in terms of composting, the amount of food waste that's coming from the school itself is too much for a community composting site. Um, not to mention, they've also got things like the um, types of food that might not be good to have in a backyard compost or a community compost set up. And they've also got all of their compostable trays as well that would need to go to an, an industrial facility. So, um, so a community compost site at a school would really be more geared towards accepting food scraps from the community rather than dealing with the food scraps that are coming from the student cafeteria. 
Um, Cause I think she had told me that they were getting, I mean, they had to have collection every single week. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of waste notes, like five cans worth of food waste. So um, for that, that was going to compost. So um, it really would be a community program. And, yeah. and I'm sure Linda or Sharon could speak a little bit more to that as well. Well, I, I just want to add, that's exactly my understanding as well. But that um, there's also, this is the lawyer in me. Um, at a certain point, if you have too much volume, you need to get permitted. You need to go through a whole regulatory process. So the whole idea of community composting is you don't reach that threshold. And I, Jen is right. The amount of food that's being generated out of the school cafeterias is just a little too much. I just, I, I have to think the um, amazing presenters that we've that we've had here tonight. If you guys want to contact them, this is where you can contact them. Email addresses for everybody. This is being recorded, so you can you know come back, take a look at it later, get some of those facts and figures that have been shared by all of our wonderful presenters tonight. All to our presenters, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Have a good night.